This is the story of Rahan Arshad, who murdered his wife and three children, who were found dead in their home in August 2006. Now, the events took place in Manchester, and in 2007, Rahan was jailed for life. In this video, I will narrate the entire story, so if you do end up liking, please subscribe. But before I continue, I have two disclaimers. Firstly, I decided I wanted to tell this story because I feel I can understand the victims and the criminal on a deeper level more than most. See, if you look at the family, they're of Pakistani origin and they ended up in Britain. My family is of Pakistani origin and we ended up in Britain. Rahan came in the 1970s. My father went in the 1970s. Rahan became a taxi driver. My father, too, was a taxi driver. If I were to draw up a portrait of my family, they would look exactly the same as this. Both parents from Pakistan, both working in the UK, two to three children. I know what they say. I know how they talk. I know their language, their mentality, their cultural beliefs, their religious beliefs, and essentially how they live their lives. I know this because I've lived it. Therefore, I will give you a full detailed account on why this crime took place, but it may offend some of you. I'm going to touch on cultural topics that are generally ignored and other topics considered sensitive. Therefore, please consider my credentials of being a member of the British Pakistani community. I am just trying to provide a detailed account of these events. And finally, all my videos will be free. I don't intend to have a membership. I don't want my videos behind a paywall. So if you do want to help support these videos, a donation link is in the description. Thank you for your consideration. Now, I want to start with the way Rahan described his wife to the jury during the trial. Just so you know, Rahan was around 36 at the time. His wife Uzma was 31. They had a son Adam, who was 11. Abbas was 8. And finally, their daughter Henna was 6. Rahan told the jury that he adored his wife and that she was beautiful. However, he also painted her as a bad-tempered, materialistic spenderholic who continually put him down and who thought herself superior to Rahan. And it's right there. That there is the crux of the story. But to understand more, it's time for a little history lesson. So, World War II ends and Britain's entire infrastructure has been decimated by the Germans. The British, with their vast empire, decide they will go to Kashmir, a disputed region between India and Pakistan. They meet with the local people and they make a deal. The British offer, we will build you roads and give you fresh water supply and in return, send us to your finest men to rebuild our country. The Pakistani immigrant to Britain was born. Thousands in their drove left an impoverished land to pursue the British dream. There is no such thing as the British dream, but it's just a play on the American dream. So this is how my grandfather ended up in England. But most importantly, with my grandfather, other grandfathers went too, including Rahan's father and Rahan's grandfather, and thousands and thousands more. Now, most of them went on to work in three different industries. Number one, steel factories, which is actually why a lot of the Pakistani community is in the north, places like Sheffield, etc. That's where they went to work. A lot of them also worked in bakeries, such as cities like Banbury near Oxford. And as time went on, a lot of them ended up being taxi drivers, which was the case with my father. So why is this relevant? So Rahan probably moved to England when he was around seven or eight. He would have learned English at the provided English learning schools. However, he, like his father, their sole priority was to make money and send it back home to their family who lived in poverty. I know this because my family did the same. Consider us economic migrants, if you will. So as time goes on, Rahan becomes an adult and probably around the age of 20, he was convinced by his parents to get married. Now you have to understand the mentality of people from subcontinent Asia. To a lot of the women over there, marriage is seen as a route to getting out of poverty. And the reason why is because a lot of the women in that area came to the Western world because of marriage. Their husbands were already here after World War II, as mentioned previously. Eventually they move to the Western world. They have a much better life. So to them, marriage is seen as the tool to get out of poverty. So with this mentality, a lot of the mothers want their sons to get married young because the same thing happened to them. And they see it as a stepping stone, a, a, a vehicle to success. So his parents convince him to get married to a woman who was back in Pakistan. And in return, this would allow her to come over to the UK and then she can provide for her family back home also. You see the perpetual cycle now, right? But 
while Rahan and Uzma and many other couples alike underestimated was the cultural clash between subcontinent Asia and Western liberalism. This is where we go back to Rahan's statement in court. He went on to say that he didn't physically abuse his wife but did claim she hit him. Rahan despised Uzma's newfound liking for Western clothes, her tight jeans and her revealing tops. Rahan went on to say it wasn't right for a mother and someone who came from Pakistan to change the way she did and dressing the way she did all of a sudden. It wasn't right at all. Have a look at that statement one more time. It's an objective statement. He's just saying it's not right and that's it. There's no nuance behind it. There's no thought behind it. There's no reasoning behind it. He just said it wasn't right. Keep that in mind. I'll come back to that later. Rohan said he struggled to keep her in the manner she had become accustomed. And again, this is where we're getting to the actual motive now. As I said earlier, like in Pakistan, it's relative poverty. You go from poverty and come to the Western world, your life changes. You have access to so many things you didn't know you had access to. And you're seeing here the struggles of integration between the two. It seemed at this point, Uzma integrated into British society a lot easier than Rahan. Now Rahan did describe to the jury that his marriage had been arranged and that Uzma was his first cousin. They had never met, but they did know of each other through the family. So to summarize so far, Rahan worked long hours as a taxi driver whilst his wife worked at a beauty salon and they had three children. Rahan then became suspicious Uzma was having an affair when her mobile phone would go on shopping trips in the car and she told the caller, I can't speak right now, I'm with my husband. At the time, Uzma insisted she was dealing with clients, you know, as she was working as a part-time beautician. Rahan said he saw text messages which confirmed the affair was real even though she denied it. When Uzma started to work as a beautician, she needed a babysitter for the youngest, Henna, who was still a baby at the time, for 90 minutes each day. Uzma eventually got in touch with their neighbour, Musra Iqbal, who would look after Henna. However, Uzma started an affair with Musra's husband, Nikki, Nikki Iqbal. When Uzma left her family and went to Pakistan in 2004, as her father died, Rahan said he wanted to teach her a lesson and sold their house for £90,000, presumably in response to an alleged affair. He then unexpectedly travelled to Pakistan, where Uzma was. She was staying with her mother, grieving over her father. He dumped the kids on her. He created some fake divorce papers with a judge signing it, and then he went travelling himself. There were even claims he married another woman in Pakistan, although he did deny this in court. Rahan in court said that was a big massive mistake. When Rahan returned from his travels, he wanted a reconciliation. After the intervention of his brother-in-law Rahat, who acted as a father figure and mediator, Rahan agreed to buy a house and put the property in both their names. However, Rahan was forced to live there on his own as his wife was unconvinced. In fact, Rahan didn't know that his wife had kept government housing on her own and he eventually suspected she was doing so so she could meet Nikki. Rahan himself embarked on a lavish spending spree but Uzma was ambivalent. She told friends that he either turned a corner or was about to kill her. Apparently, Uzma said to her friends, Count the days until he kills me. To woo his wife, Rahan bought a $30,000 BMW, telling his wife it was an early birthday present. In fact, he had actually bought the car on lease, paid just one instalment, and had insured only his own name. Just so you know, in England back then, car insurance, or whoever drove the car, had to be insured on the car. In America, that's not always the case. He went on to buy computers for the kids, which in 2006 was a big deal, or early 2000s. He bought bangles and gold jewellery for Uzma. He redecorated the house with new wardrobes, carpets and a new banister. But his spending spree failed to convince Uzma there was hope for their marriage. Now it's clear they were having marriage difficulties and Rahan, probably through impulse, was trying his best to get his wife back on side. But this ultimately failed when he learned for sure of his wife's affair. It was claimed Uzma had a passionate affair for three years before she was brutally murdered. Uzma met Nikki Iqbal for secret sex sessions at relatives' homes and spent time with the delivery driver in Pakistan. This confirmed that when Uzma went to Pakistan to grieve over her father, Nikki was actually there. Maybe not at their house in Pakistan, but nearby. Now the pair denied their affair, but Nikki did tell the media that Uzma plagued his wife with phone calls, so he eventually he ended the relationship. They began the affair in late 2003, 
as Uzma was unhappy with her marriage. Nikki told the media, I did love her. We were very close. Her life was hard at home. Rahan was aggressive. But in the end, she treated me badly. She was using me for money. Nikki went on to say, I was at my brother's house and she used to come there. I saw her and thought she was nice. I got her number and we took it from there. We would meet occasionally, anywhere, wherever. So Rahan did go to Nikki and challenge him back in 2003 regarding the affair. Nikki told the media, she must have been winding him up and saying things to him. I told him where to go. Musarat, the wife of Nikki, who was 35 at the time, who did eventually forgive Nikki, confronted Uzma in 2004. Musarat said, I thought something was going on, so I asked her and she said, I'm not like that. And it was also surprising that dad of four Nikki supported Uzma by paying for tickets to get her back home when she went to Pakistan, after Rahan had sold the house, as mentioned previously. But Nikki was astonished when Uzma rang his wife randomly one night. Musarat said, she phoned me and said, I'm with Nikki. I'm married to your husband in Pakistan and you can't do anything, you bitch. I told Nikki I wanted a divorce. But he told me everything and said he was going to leave her. Nikki said, There's no way in this world I would go and marry another woman when I have four kids. Nikki said he last slept with Uzma a good couple of months before the murders. Uzma had told him, She said she was going to give it another try with Rahan. And I said, Good luck, give it a try. And she did. Now, on July 28th, 2006, after Rahan learned of the affair, clearly distressed and without anyone to console him, Rahan attacked his wife in a bedroom and covered her body with a towel. He then carried each of his sleeping children downstairs, first battering Abbas, then Henna, and then Adam. He covered their bodies after each attack. His wife Uzma suffered 23 blows to her head and body from the bat, and he later hid the bat in the garden shed. He then drove to Heathrow Airport in his BMW and got on a plane to Bangkok and travelled on to Phuket in southern Thailand. Now, it was still four weeks later that the decomposing bodies were found as a neighbour managed to smell rotting flesh and called the police. Now, it was revealed that Rahan had planned the murders in advance by buying a bat the day before of the murders and booking his tickets to Thailand more than two weeks earlier. Police detectives eventually tracked him down in Thailand. When arrested, he told officers, I confess to the murder, my beautiful kids, I don't regret killing that bitch, but my kids, killing my kids. But he later refused to answer police questions, claiming his wife had beaten the children to death and he had killed her. Detective Martin Bottomley, who led the investigation, went on to say, this is one of the most brutal and devastating murders I've ever dealt with. Many of us have children, which makes the brutality Rahan used to kill his own children even harder to comprehend. The only time he showed any remorse is when he first got off the plane from Thailand. Now the last known sighting of the children was one day before the murders took place. This was on the final day of term at Bradshaw Hall Primary School. Upon Rahan fleeing, it was understood murder squad detectives had been holding talks with authorities in Thailand about flying out to Bangkok in a bid to track down Rahan. It is understood that Rahan had been traced by police in Thailand earlier that week and had agreed to return to his country voluntarily. The body's post-mortem examinations reveal they all died of severe head injuries. Rahan's BMW was found abandoned at Heathrow the day after the bodies were discovered, and that's when Nikki and Musrat were also arrested on suspicion of murder. Detective Martin Bottomley continued to say, As you know, we are investigating the murders of Uzma and her three children, whose bodies were discovered on Sunday 20th of August. We have been liaising with law enforcement authorities in Thailand following the discovery of a silver BMW car. As a result of those inquiries, Rahan was questioned by Thai authorities and eventually Rahan voluntarily boarded a Thai Airlines flight in Bangkok to return to the UK. Uzma's mother and two brothers were in the public gallery beside friends and other relatives as the verdicts came in during trial. Her brother Rahat shouted yes as the jury convicted Arshad. Describing the murders as brutal and horrific, the judge said Rahan had been convicted on overwhelming evidence. The judge said, You killed your entire family in circumstances of great brutality. You beat your wife to death in a bedroom and then coldly and deliberately you brought your sleepy children downstairs to meet their deaths. There is no suggestion of mental illness on your part. Life imprisonment in your case means life. Now I'm going to give you my thoughts and conclusion on this case. To me, 
this was a clash of civilizations. Yes, I know I'm probably hyping it and overstating it. However, if you have a look at the way Uzma was raised, and I would know, as I said, I'm from, my family's from Pakistan. I've been to Pakistan many times. I know how they live. The woman is at home looking after the kids, providing for the kids, you know, cleaning the kitchen, cleaning the house, the usual household duties, while the husband is out for 12 to 15 hours a day making money. The little pennies that he makes, he brings it home. And everybody, everybody lives in poverty. So then Rahan comes along and Uzma sees a, a ticket, a ticket to, to greener pastures, right? Oh my God, I can go to England. I can leave this place. I can have a better life. So she takes it, even though the two would never have spoken. And just so we're clear, Uzma and a thousand other people have done the same. This is commonplace. So she arrives in England, but it's a grave reality. England is a very expensive place to live. Generally speaking, both parents need to be working. You gotta pay for your house, you gotta pay for your car, you gotta provide for your kids. So she has to work and he's working. And she's working in a beauty salon and what does she see? She sees other women similar to her. Pakistani, Indian, Sri Lankan, you know, of Asian descent who live in massive houses, who have rich husbands, possibly. Uh, again, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm assuming, and she thinks, I want that. Why can't my husband provide that for me? We are in a country to do so. I didn't leave Pakistan so I can work eight hours a day here. Again, I'm guessing. I'm not saying she's wrong. I'm just trying to understand her mentality. Couple that by the fact that her husband is gone 15 hours a day. She doesn't get the attention she wants. She has to look after three children and children are hard work. That's for sure. And she has to work and she has to find the babysitter and she has to do that all alone because again, her husband is never home. But according to Rahan, this is just normal. I'm out all day, I'm working. What do you want me to do, right? That's what he's thinking in his head. But Rahan probably has never considered that his wife has emotional and physical needs, which is why she went looking elsewhere. And this is where Nikki comes in. But Nikki, in reality, is irrelevant to this story. Nikki is just a observant bystander. And you can see the emotional impulses of Rahan. One minute he hates her, as he thinks she's cheating on him, so he sells the house. By the way, who on earth does that, right? Someone cheats on you, have a go at them, go approach the person who they're cheating with or whatever. You don't go sell the house. Like, what is wrong with you? But anyway, sells the house, leaves the kids with her in Pakistan. Imagine that. He, he's not even thinking about his kids. He's thinking about himself, clearly. Then he realizes a week or two or a month later, oh my God, I do love her. So he tries winning her back. BMW, get a house, decorate the house. He's, he tries to throw money at the problem. When the actual problem was, he didn't want the kids and he didn't want her and he had enough, but he couldn't let go. Why? Because of shame and because of honor. Rahan could have been honest and said, kids, I don't want you anymore. Mom or wife, sorry, I don't want you anymore. Let me walk away. Let's have a custody situation. Let's move on with our lives. But he couldn't do it because to him, what his parents thought of him, what his actual brothers and sisters and siblings would think of him, or what society would think of him was far more important to him than the sanctity of his children. We can all agree that a healthy household is the best context for children. But if you don't want your children, or if you don't want to be with the mother of the children, it is far more healthier for them, for you to be away, than to have a toxic household. Whether you agree or not, you understand the concept I'm coming across, right? But he was too weak to face that eventuality. And when he found out, again, emotional impulse kicked in, gets a baseball bat and the rest is history. The only way I can conclude on this is it is the height of stupidity. But I guess in hindsight, maybe something like this was a ticking time bomb the moment they got married. May the children rest in peace. May Uzma rest in peace. And I don't think any one of us could care less for Rahan. Thank you for watching.